Hello everyone, XCT here. In this video we are going to solve the latest addition to Vulnab called T. This is an AD lab consisting of two vulnerable machines and involves CI/CD runners, labs version 2 and Windows Server update services. So let's go. Before we begin we have to start the machine so um, let me just show you how that's done in the lab. You just go here, type chain because that's like multiple machines. You put in T, you press the start button and like after a few seconds should be up. Yes, here we go. You get the IPs and then you can just start in the lab here, right? Um, I already scanned both of the machines, so I'm not going to repeat it to save some time. Um, there are two machines here. Um, one has RDP open and one has RDP open and port 3000. Um, so that's basically it from the scanning side. So let's get started. So let's check if this port 3000 is actually a website. Um, just go to it in the browser and we can see it's Gitty, all right. Um, always good to check Explore here to see if there are any public repositories, but there aren't any here, okay. So users, there's only administrator, organizations, nothing, okay. So we can't really do much here. Um, maybe we can sign up. Let's, let's try that. Um, yeah, I think, do it like this. And this works, we can make an account. Um, let's see if we can see more now. No, there's still no repository. Okay. Um, maybe let's check out the settings of Gitty here, see if there's anything unusual. And if you go to actions here, um, you can see that there's variables, secrets, there's nothing here, but you could like check if there's one. And runners. And for runners, we actually have an entry here. So there's some process running on the machine that's um, basically there for building stuff, for example, or running post commit actions in the end. So imagine you have a project that needs to be compiled. You can basically tell the runner to compile it. That's, that's how it works. And how CICD pipelines usually are set up. Um, there can be multiple of these runners, multiple steps and so on. Um, in this case, it's just one thing that's executing stuff. Um, all right, so there's a runner and maybe we are able to use it, right? So how do we do that? Let's first create a new repository here, just, just call it test. All right, um, it's completely empty now. And if you go to settings here, um, there should be some option to let us activate the runner for the repository. Yeah, here, actions, right? Now, if we update the settings, um, actions are enabled here. So how does the runner know what to do when we commit? Um, we have to tell it um, that somehow, right? So this is the point where you have to read the docs. Um, let's go git the actions. I think it was released um, like in the first half of 2023, so it's still pretty fresh. Um, there's some info here on what it is. Um, delegates jobs to runners, um, standalone program written in Go, and it does the stuff, okay. What we really need is like um, a template of sort to, to see what we have to put in the repository to actually get the runner to do something, right? And so you just have to like go through the docs here. Um, there's a post from, it's a bit older, but it's like a preview of Gitty Actions. Um, I think if you scroll a bit here, you should actually find an example on how it looks like. Yes, so this is a good example here. Let me make that a bit bigger. Um, you have to create a YAML file like this. .git workflows build YAML, um, then give it a name, um, basically define a job, give that a name. Um, then you have to define a platform it runs on. So here it does Ubuntu latest. Um, we saw on the runner earlier that ours is Windows, so we probably have to do Windows here instead of Ubuntu. And then on the steps, it looks like you can just put uh, shell commands, right? They just do run and then echo. So that's probably being executed in bash on Ubuntu. All right, so let's actually copy that here and create this file here. And you can do that from the uh, web UI. You don't really have to like check it out or something. All right, um, and now we put a template here. So we do it like this. This is very similar to the example, right? Except Ubuntu latest is Windows latest and we give it a name here and then I think it was run, right? Run and then we can do PowerShell and then put something here and it might be executed. Let me actually put a simple reverse shell thingy here. This is also on bonedev.io and probably in various other places. It's just a simple PowerShell reverse shell one-liner. Yeah, it's connecting to my machine on port 443. So before I do that, I probably want to open a listener here. 
All right, mm, I just copy the, the base64 here. All right, let's put that here. Um, remove the dots again, I guess. And then, well, just save commit. I think it's running, I just clicked it twice, yes. And then if you hover the commit here, um, you can see that some something is doing something, right? It's the runner now executing um, here in the action tab. So if you go here um, and then do where am I? We can see that we got the shell. So that's like a really easy way to get a shell on the machine. Um, but like I said, it requires some research to like find out how the format for runners looks like and how you enable it in the first place, um, in which file to put it and so on. All right. So now that we have a shell, we can basically get the first flag. All right, um, let's do a who am I all here, just to see what kind of privileges we have. Um, well, we don't have too many, right? Um, the privileges itself are just two here, which are completely useless. We are in two groups, we are in server administration and in developers, which is kind of interesting. Um, but really, we don't know too much yet. Um, let's go to C here, um, just list the directories. There's Git, there's a web server. Um, I mean, you can check if you can like write there, right? It's always like a good idea. Um, let's see, inetpub, yes. Then just type something here, but the file doesn't appear, so we don't have permissions. You can always check it properly here and see that we don't have write privileges, right? Okay. So what else is there? This PowerShell shell, right? If you just do dir here, you won't see hidden folders. Um, you can easily see that because program data is missing and program data is something that's always there. How can we show the hidden folders? So we do cmdc dir slash a, and then we see everything. So you can see recycle bin and so on. Um, but there's also one directory here that's new, that's underscore install, and if we go there, you can see that a couple of, um, well, installation related files, right? So there's labs, um, labs installer. So maybe that's a good hint that something labs related is in place on this machine. So what's labs? That's the local administrator password solution. And what it does is rotate the local administrator password in some interval that the admin can set. So the administrator password is probably random and it's set like every 30 days or something like that. Um, and the way this works is that certain users have permissions to read these passwords, um, but we don't really know which groups these are, so we can't really know at this point. Um, other than that, of course, we can do like check the program files directories and so on to see what's installed, like just doing some, some basic enum on the box. Um, but pretty quickly, we don't really see anything here. So um, if you go to install again, I'm just going to use that as my working directory. What I want to do here is basically get a beacon in Sliver, um, just so I can run all the tools I have in Sliver, like Sharphound and, I don't know, Mimikatz, or if I want to run something like that, right? I can do it via Sliver without worrying about the AV too much. So let's do that. I already have Sliver running here, but I'm going to start the listener on port 8443, and I'm also going to generate a payload here, just like that. I'm generating a beacon. I'm telling it to call back every five seconds. That's like really fast, but I want to make it fast for the video. Um, yeah, we'll connect back to the port I just defined and I'm going to save the beacon there. Um, nothing too crazy here. And we wait a second for this to compile. All right, we got our beacon. Um, and in jobs, you can see that all is now running. Okay, so now I already have a web server running here and the beacon.exe is also here. So I can just pull it over into the install folder or anywhere I like really. Now it's here and we should be able to run it and get a beacon. Let's see. Yes, that was fast. Our beacon checked in and now we can like, I don't know, do an LS and should probably be in the install folder. Yes, okay. So now that we have a beacon, let's collect Bloodhound data. So I'm going to do Sharphound 4, so that's the a bit newer format, um, dash i for in process execution, so otherwise it would like spawn a new process and inject there, which can be found by the AV usually, so we just do dash i. Um, dash s, I think, is to save the output. Um, T is delay. Um, if you run Sharphound, you probably want to increase it a bit because it default to 60 seconds and Sharphound might take longer than that. All right, let's actually run that. 
And yeah, after a while we should get the Bloodhound zip, which we can download to our machine. All right, you can see that this was successful. We get the output here, and maybe let's do another last to show. Yeah, the, the Bloodhound zip is now here, so that's all fine. We can download it. Um, I already loaded it into Bloodhound here to save some time. So this is the Bloodhound view of the domain, and if we, I think we called Wallace or something, Thomas? Yes. Um, just check the user here. We can see we have a session on the server. Um, okay, we already knew that. Um, nothing too interesting here, I think. Let's see, group membership. We are in domain users, developers, and server administration. We already saw that, but we still don't know what server administration does, right? Let's see, outbound object control. Um, well, we don't really control anything, right? These are just uh, group memberships. So there isn't much here. Um, but you saw the MSI from, from labs, right? So if you go for labs here, you can also see that it's in play here. Um, this is a GPO, and this is affecting uh, organizational unit. So someone set it up to um, basically work on servers. And in servers, we probably find our server. Um, let's see, shouldn't I be able to like expand this here? Let's see, computer objects, yes. Um, so labs is affecting the system we are on. So now we have confirmation. Um, we don't really know who can read labs passwords yet, but I mean, it doesn't really hurt to try if we can do it, right? So let's just do the PowerShell command here, get labs ID password and give the identity, which is the current system, SRV. And yeah, it's true, we can read labs passwords. So we kind of had to guess that we have the permission because we didn't really see it. Um, but yeah, just, just trying is the easiest way in this case, right? And yeah, um, if I add the S plain text parameter, I will get the plain text password. I don't want to show it here uh, in the video, but yeah, but just add dash S plain text and you will get the real password. Okay, so we got the administrator password. That's pretty nice. The, the reason we didn't really see that in Bloodhound is because this is Labs version 2 and this works a bit differently, like internally. And I think the tools haven't really caught up with it yet. So um, yeah, you just have to try it or, or maybe you find some other way to enumerate it. Um, there's a great post here by XPN, which shows some internals about Labs uh, version 2 how to configure it, which is like really good if you want to try it in the lab, and also like the internals of the whole thing, how it works and so on, and a way to decrypt the passwords as well. Um, we did it with PowerShell here because that's just the easiest way, but if you want to dive a bit deeper into this, um, check out this post, really good. Okay, so now we got the administrator password. So let's just do a run as here to get the beacon and administrator. And you can see now we have a beacon. That's what we wanted. And yeah, well, now we have to check if there's some way to escalate in the domain. Um, one thing we can check is like open ports, some enumeration, right? We can use a beacon object file for that, um, which is just doing nets that we could also do it in the console we have as the Thomas Wallace user. And if you look at the ports, there are some unusual ones, right? What is this 8530, right? That's um, definitely not um, something we often see, so... Okay, apparently this is used in Configuration Manager, but that's not really what it's used for here, so that didn't really help too much. Um, otherwise, we can also, like, if we go to C here, um, you can see this is the Windows Server Update Services server. So the server in the domain is responsible for distributing Windows updates and possibly for other software to all machines in the domain, or at least for the machines that have been configured. So maybe the other machine in the domain, the domain controller, is getting updates from this machine and we are administrator on this machine. So we have some control over which updates are getting published. So this kind of sounds like an exploitable scenario, right? Um, we are on the machine that controls the updates for the domain controller. So maybe we can use that to become DA. Before I miss it, um, you can, of course, always get another flag here because after the privilege escalation, there's usually a flag and you can see it's on the desktop here, right? Okay, so there's a tool here that can basically create such an update that we can maybe push to the rest of the domain, which is the sharp w sus. All right, um, let's see how this works. We can create an update. We need to provide a binary file and we can provide arguments to it. Okay, 
then some metadata and that's basically it. And then we approve the update and it will get distributed. Sounds easy enough, but in this case, it isn't really that straightforward. Um, there's a pull request here. And if you look at the content, you can see that apparently some kind of content directory changed maybe over the years. Um, and there's a mismatch between what's in the registry and what's in a database. So um, TechSpans here did the pull request and in his own repository, he basically uh, fixed that. So it gets it from the database. So what we want to do is, um, so we actually want to get this version um, instead of the original one um, for now until the pull request is merged. So it works. Okay, so I already like downloaded this and compiled it and have it on my machine. And now we have to think about how to use it. Okay, so I'm going to do that on RDP just so I can show you the UI as well. Um, let's go to CMD here and run the tool. Um, we essentially tell it to um, run psxec. It does need to be a signed Microsoft executable, so you have to put something that fits that description. So, I don't know, psexec, any other like signed tool is fine as well, like MS Build or CMD or whatever. And as arguments, you give it um, basically the command you want to execute. Um, which is in this case PS exec with CMD and CMD will add a user for us on the machine and add it to the administrators group. So let's run this. And it's telling us the update was created. Another thing we have to do is deploy it or not, not deploy, but um, approve it. So let's do that. It already has the update ID in here. We just have to replace the group name, um, just call it custom one. And then we have to put the machine we want to run it on, which is the DC. So this should approve it. And now if we go here, we should see the approved updates in the updates list in this UI here of WSUS. Okay, so we can see it's here. And from the description, you can see it's called sharp WSUS update, which is, well, of course, suspicious. So there are options to change all of that. Um, there's also an attitude here in the description. So there are a lot of parameters you can set to make this less suspicious if you want to use it on the real engagement. And this looks good. It looks like 100% here. So how do we see if this worked? Well, um, first of all, we need to get in domain context. So let's just like do it like this to become system. Um, like this, right? Yes. And then we can do net users domain. And we can see that it added XCT as a domain user. But if we go here and want to try like to RDP, we will see that it doesn't work. So it added the user, but it probably failed in adding it to the administrator group. Um, I'm not exactly sure why that's the case, but it's not really a problem because we can just do it again, right? We just run that again. Um, Let's see, net local group administrators xct app. That should be good, I think. And then we have to approve it again. Just call it custom or two here. These group names, I believe, have to be unique. So you have to choose a different one. And then we do dc.t.vl. Like this should be good, I think. Now it shows the second update here. Okay, this is at 100% here as well, so now maybe it works, let's see. And yes, this looks good. So now the user was added to the administrators group and we are on the DC. Um, you can also like execute other stuff, could like run a new beacon or something like that. Totally up to you. And as local administrator on the DC, well, we can do anything in the domain. So that's basically it. Let's also see if we can get the flag here. To use us, it's usually on the administrator. And here's the final flag. So that's it for the chain. If you want to try it out, you can go to vanlab.com and get lab access, and then you can just spawn it and do it yourself, along with many, many other machines. So again, thank you and see you next time. Bye bye.